Americans, but it isn't all bad news. And rebuilding and reinforcing in muddy California. Now, live, this is Global News. Good evening. Vancouver City Council is threatening to clamp down on one of our city's more colorful street fixtures, buskers. Council wants to not only make licenses mandatory, it also wants to regulate where street performers play, what they play, and how long they play. Peter Clemente has more. There were very few of them out today because of the rain and the cold wind. But when the sun shines, you can find them just about anywhere entertaining on street corners. Some pretty good bands and artists got their start this way. Jan Arden, for example, and even the Bare Naked Ladies. But the regulators at City Hall say some of those who pass themselves off as buskers and street performers are more of a nuisance than anything else. Some of them can't play, some of them can't sing, and some of them don't do any more than one song. City engineer Dave Rudberg says that's driving some merchants and downtown residents around the band. It's time to think about licensing. It's an attempt to, to control those that develop problems. Uh, say somebody that plays the same song over and over again at the same location, or loud amplified music, or um, we've even had uh, uh, people juggling knives on the, on the sidewalk. It's an attempt to control those kinds of problem activities. James Williams has been busking here on Robson Street, he says, for nigh on to 28 years now. He's on a disability pension and says that he would starve if not for busking. He probably couldn't pay the licensing fee. Could you afford to pay that? Do you think that's a good idea? Well, if that's the way it is, I guess that's the way it's got to be. But I mean, I mean, my, me, myself, I, I figure that uh, people should have a little compassion on people that are out here trying to make an honest living, like trying to few, sing a few songs today and make people happy. And, uh, you know, I put my heart into what I do. Out in front of the liquor store and commercial drive is always a good place for buskers. But the one that was there today said licensing will not solve any problems that City Hall may be having. People who are masquerading as buskers and doing something else that we wish to regulate, that's not going to change them. They're going to do something else anyway. The whole issue of licensing buskers will come before a city council committee on Thursday. The licensing could be in place for the tourist season. Peter Clemente, Global News, Vancouver. Granville Street shop owners upset with a plan to bring rapid bus service to Granville turned to the public for help today. They organized a citizen's plebiscite, setting up some 20 voting stations along the Granville corridor. BC Transit has proposed a rapid bus service along Granville, which merchants say will drive away their business. People are actually really shocked, I think. They're um, really upset that this type of thing has started, it's already in the process without them knowing anything about it. I mean, BC Transit has actually came, came out on CBC uh, last week saying that this was pretty much a done deal. They'd already put the order in for the buses and people in the neighborhood had no idea, so they're really upset. And the last of the three days of public hearings into proposed changes to Canada's Immigration and Refugee Act wrapped up at the Waterfront Hotel today. Immigration Minister Lucien Robillard spent Friday at the hearings getting the B.C. perspective on the controversial changes. Community leaders and immigration activists seem to be most upset with the language requirement, which would have immigrants speak either English or French before they can enter the country. The fighting moved from the stage to the stands last night at the WWF wrestling show at GM Place. A scuffle broke out when one of the spectators apparently became ill in his seat. Security guards came to check up on the man and take him outside, but the man's friends jumped in and a fight ensued. Twenty officers were called in, some carrying Arwen guns, to clear a path to the stage for the wrestlers. In the end, about a dozen people were thrown out. The show in the ring was, was not affected. A sick because I've had a little bit to drink tonight, but I was okay. But the thing is, they uh, I don't mind if they eject me, but they ejected all my friends. Oh. Well, there was too much alcohol involved with the crowd. I don't know if it was all served inside or people drinking before they got here. And the lights were down low and people were uh, armed with a number of projectiles, including golf balls and these were being thrown from the crowd towards the police officers and security and some of the wrestlers, so we had to control that. A stunt gone wrong led to some minor flooding in the Vancouver Public Library this morning. An explosion device was detonated while film crews were rolling. They didn't expect the small blast to trigger the sprinkler system. Luckily, there are no reports of any books or library equipment being damaged. 
The lawyer for a 15-year-old girl charged in the death of Rena Verk says he will appeal a decision that will see his client be tried in adult court. The teen is charged with second-degree murder, but her name cannot be released unless she loses her appeal. Two other teens are awaiting trial on murder charges. Three girls have already been convicted of assault. Last year was a record year for the port of Vancouver. More than 73 million tons of cargo handled and container traffic up by close to 20 percent. But it's a much different story today. Two of the biggest shipping companies say a depressed Asian market is forcing them to pull out of Vancouver. Tara Short has the story. You're looking at about two and a half football fields of deck space. It is 750 feet long. Fully loaded, it carries more than 800 containers. And those containers are filled with anything from malt for breweries to wood products, most of it bound for the Asian markets. Last year, close to 750,000 containers left this port, bringing an estimated $750 million into the local economy. But yesterday, Maersk of Denmark and Sealand of the U.S. announced that they would no longer be stopping in Vancouver. It comes down to supply and demand. There are just too many shipping companies going after too little cargo. And part of the reason is because of Canada's Asian customers, and they are cutting back themselves because of their own devalued currencies. There's nothing we can do in that particular situation because there's clearly a decline in the, the economies of Asia and this traffic will come back to Vancouver. We're very confident of that. But we're going to see some uh, short-term decline in uh, shipping into Vancouver simply because they're not consuming as much of our products as they were before. And that may affect jobs in the short term. A union representative for the Longshoremen says that Sealand Maersk needs about 200 people a week to load and unload the ship. Now that it won't be coming into port, those jobs may be at risk. But the good news is that Hinjin and another container shipping company called K-Line are planning to each bring in one more ship per week into Vancouver, so those jobs may be spared for now. But it doesn't preclude a downturn in the shipping industry down the road that may further affect the economy on Vancouver's waterfront. Tara Short, Global News, Vancouver. We may soon know more about the crash that killed Princess Diana. Still ahead on Global News, new memories come flooding back to the only person to survive that crash. Hey, we had a real busy day in the sports world. Six uh, NHL games are already complete. We'll have lots of highlights for you on early sports page. And we will also tell you about a BC Lion who is heading south. Alfred Jackson caught a lot of passes here last year. He'll be in Baltimore next year. And will Saddam Hussein keep his promise? The U.S. has some concerns. That story is next. You're watching Global News, where news is now. One week ago tonight, U.S. military intervention against Iraq was almost certain. Then came the deal. And now comes the hard part, ensuring Iraq keeps its promises about allowing U.N. arms inspections. Kevin Tibbles reports. U.N. weapons monitors headed out this morning as they do almost every morning to visit some of the 473 sites under observation. But they won't get near the eight presidential palaces or more than 100 other unmonitored sites where U.N. inspectors suspect chemical and biological weapons may be hidden. Those places must await the arrival of the chief U.N. weapons inspector Richard Butler and a team of U.N. diplomats to accompany the inspectors. But today, Iraq threw new doubts on how and when those inspections would occur by dismissing a proposed UN resolution that would punish Iraq if it failed to give the inspectors access. We feel totally unnecessary to have any Security Council resolution. The stakes are high because the inspectors want answers to some big questions. Where are 17 tons of so-called growth media used to breed germs which could be used to make biological weapons? Where are more than 130 germ bombs that Iraq has admitted building? Inspectors have found just 25 germ bombs. And where are at least six nozzles, the kind used on airplanes to spray pesticides on crops, that Iraq may have adapted to military use? But while the inspectors are suspicious of the Iraqis, the Iraqis are just as suspicious of them. They don't tell the truth. They don't make conclusive judgments. Last week's agreement between Saddam Hussein and UN Secretary General Kofi Annan averted a military strike. In return, Iraq promised to open all doors to inspection. But Iraq insists 
its sovereignty and dignity be respected. We need to talk to the Iraqi authorities in the same spirit of what uh, probably the Secretary General has done during his weekend here. Today in New York, hundreds marched on the United Nations urging that last week's agreement be a first step toward lifting economic sanctions on Iraq. The real test will come when the weapons inspectors try to visit the controversial sites. But the more time that passes, the greater the suspicion that Iraq has simply found new hiding places. Kevin Tibbles, NBC News, Baghdad. Also in the Middle East, Israeli soldiers are under fire from pro-Iranian Hezbollah guerrillas tonight. The attack comes after Israeli warplanes and artillery pounded Hezbollah villages. Yesterday, guerrillas clashed with soldiers at an Israeli outpost, killing one person and injuring four others. Hezbollah wants Israeli forces and their military allies out of the so-called security zone in South Lebanon. A tragedy in Pakistan tonight. At least eight people are dead and 29 people are hurt after two bombs exploded in a densely populated apartment complex. The bombs went off 20 minutes apart in two shops on the ground floor of the building. No one has claimed responsibility for the explosions yet, but the apartment's residents are ethnic Pathans who have clashed with rival factions in the past. The death toll is rising in Ecuador as rescue workers continue searching for victims of an oil explosion. So far, at least seven people are dead and dozens of others injured. The pipeline ruptured yesterday morning, setting off a huge ball of 20-meter-high flames. The fire traveled down the river, destroying dozens of homes. The last polls are closed in India tonight after 12 days of parliamentary elections. But as Anita Pratap reports, the voting has been marred by violence. Voting is underway for 131 of India's 543 parliamentary constituencies. This is the third and last major round of voting. Voter turnout was low in Srinagar, Kashmir, where rebel groups have called for a poll boycott and a general strike. Shops were shut and streets deserted. It is a civilian. I'm really surprised no one has shown up. <laughs> Security forces used tear gas and batons to break up an anti-election demonstration. Polling is going on smoothly in other parts of India, including Mumbai, India's commercial capital. But yesterday, three bombs exploded in the city, killing four people. No one has claimed responsibility. On the eve of the earlier round of voting, a series of bombs killed 46 people in the South Indian city of Coimbatore, a region where Muslim fundamentalist groups are active. Indian Prime Minister Inder Kumar Gujral blames Pakistan's intelligence agency for the Coimbatore bombings, describing them as a Pakistani plot to disrupt India's electoral process. Pakistan denies the charge. The results of this election, which has been spread over 12 days, will be announced beginning March 2nd. No party is expected to win a majority to rule on their own, though the Hindu nationalist BJP is expected to win the most number of seats. Anita Pratap, CNN, New Delhi. In Russia's government, three of the country's top officials are out of a job tonight. Russian President Boris Yeltsin fired a vice premier and the transportation and education ministers. He blames the three cabinet ministers for the country's economic woes. The move is not a total surprise. Earlier this week, Yeltsin threatened to fire those responsible for the government's poor performance. British tabloids are reporting that Prince William has told his father he doesn't want to be king. Senior palace aides are quoted as saying William is a frustrated young man who only sees years of misery for the royal family. As well, the young prince reportedly argued over the issue with his mother, Princess Diana, before she was killed. Meanwhile, the bodyguard who survived the accident that killed Princess Diana says he now remembers more about the crash. Trevor Rhys Jones says he will meet again with the French judge who was heading the crash investigation. Those memories were apparently triggered after a series of sessions with a psychiatrist. Sudan is a nation racked by civil war, and people are well aware of the famine and starvation that war has caused. But as Jason Evans tells us, it is killing the people of Sudan in another way. These stone circles are graves, tombstones for the dead of Sudan. And there are more and more circles being built every day. Sudan, a nation already racked by civil war, is fighting a losing war against a much smaller killer, the tiny tsetse fly. The flies carry a disease called sleeping sickness, and sleeping sickness kills. Untreated, it drives its victims to fits of madness and eventually death. 
This sleeping sickness victim has been tied to a hut in his village to keep him from running off or hurting someone. The flies can bite anyone, but they usually live near water, making the women and children who gather water especially vulnerable to the disease. The sad part is that sleeping sickness is not difficult to control with the right medication. But medicine is expensive, and when Sudan's civil war flared in 1989, Belgium was forced to end its medical program in the country. Since then, sleeping sickness has spread like wildfire. Since the departure of the Belgians, the prevalence has risen from 0.5% to the current approximate 20%, so way above what we define as an epidemic. So this is an epidemic of really catastrophic proportions. A major effort is underway to test for victims of the disease, not just to treat them, but also to prevent the spread of sleeping sickness. Every time a fly bites someone with the disease, that fly becomes a carrier. So if more people have it, then more flies will carry it, and more uninfected people will catch it. Aid workers are worried that despite their efforts, sleeping sickness is winning this fight. I think that nobody in the world really understands that there's a sleeping sickness epidemic here. 100% um, of these people will die if they don't receive medication. And it's my hope that we'll get funding to extend the program uh, in South Sudan because these people have virtually nothing. And they're dependent on the outside world for help. It can cost more than $1,000 to cure a victim of the disease. The International Medical Corps is traveling across southern Sudan, village by village, testing for the disease, testing every single person. They say it could cost $10 million to control the epidemic, money they just do not have. But they're still trying, because stopping means that hundreds of thousands of people will probably die. Jason Evans, CNN reporting. While well, Mardi Gras revelers on this hemisphere are recuperating from last week's celebrations, they are just kicking off the big party down under. Except this parade has a little twist. It's the 20th annual Gay Pride Parade, affectionately dubbed the Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras. About 750,000 spectators gathered along the parade route to watch more than 270 floats and about 19,000 participants, many of them scantily clad. And for the first time this year, the parade included gay police officers, but they were dressed in full uniform. It's billed as one of the world's largest gay pride gatherings. If he only knew what a fuss he was causing, he'd probably be rolling over in his grave right now. Still to come on Global News, the latest on the long battle over the bones of Russia's last czar. Well, we've got an ugly one going right now. We're going to see some improvements starting tomorrow, and we will fill you in on all the weather details just ahead. And in Florida, mourning for the victims of last week's tornadoes. That's coming up. A search for a missing snowboarder on Blackcomb Mountain has ended in tragedy. 23-year-old David Lund of Vancouver was reported missing last night, and the ski patrol and search and rescue started looking for him then. This morning, with the help of a helicopter and search dogs, they found Lund's body about 200 meters outside of the ski area boundary. No word yet on the exact cause of death. Mother Nature is giving Californians a much-needed break for the moment. But now, muddied Golden State is still dealing with serious problems caused by El Nino-driven heavy rains. It's halftime in the El Nino season, and not everyone is resting. Government crews are working overtime to repair the scars left behind by weeks of constant pounding rain and mudslides. We're going out and evaluating the storm system, the, the drainage channels, cleaning those out. There is so much work to be done. And uh, we have our geologists trying to figure out... That Wayne Heath, who retired from California's Department of Transportation two years ago, is back as a supervisor. With all the uh, damage we've got to the, to the highways in Ventura County, uh, they needed some extra help. In San Francisco, crews are working this weekend patching potholes. They need a couple days of sunshine for repairs to seal. We have been having crews ever since the storm has led up to do all the patching. From, uh, from the time they start in the morning until late in, late in the evening. We've also had crews working Saturday and Sunday. And homeowners are working too. Paul Omen is shoring up his beachfront property near San Diego, protection against the next wave that could wipe him out. I think everything will be all right. 
Nelson Yardley has been sweeping and shoveling half a foot of mud from the front yard of his home near Malibu. Five days with no rain giving him the first chance to clean up. Hope it lasts for another week because it'll take me that long to remove all this stuff. As if cleaning up and getting ready for the next round of storms isn't bad enough, now comes a warning from doctors. Digging through debris or getting rid of dirt and muddy water might be hazardous to your health. Tetanus is the danger, and 65-year-old Harriet Miller is taking no chances. She's getting vaccinated as a safeguard against the deadly disease. If we get a puncture wound or a laceration, the bacterium can easily enter through the skin and cause problems. So a careful but necessary cleanup up and down the California coast, rushing to recover between rounds with El Nino, knowing that every hour counts. Dan Lothian, NBC News, Los Angeles. And Joe Leary joins us now with weather. Joe, it looks pretty stormy out there yourself where you are. Not, uh, not a good looking night, Simi, but you don't hear me complaining about it. We're out here to uh, show you that we do have this trough of low pressure, which is uh, resulting in some fairly significant showers at this hour. Now, we are going to see a little bit of improvement come tomorrow, but uh, between now and then, we're going to expect to see basically this through the rest of the night. As for how things look right now, to no surprise, we do have uh, showers around. Uh, in the uh, downtown core, we're at temperature about 7 degrees. The winds have uh, sort of died down as of the last little while. The barometer is falling and good air quality in the downtown core. Now, as far as our temperature records go, we uh, check the almanac, and our high temperature today was 7 degrees. We uh, normally would receive a temperature reading of 9. So uh, once again, we've been uh, fairly, uh, I guess, lucky over the past uh, few weeks or so to be on the plus side of the uh, normal temperatures and for the last day or two, we've been a little bit below the uh, normal. Now what's happened is that we have this trough of low pressure which has hit us here over the south coast, resulting in uh, some showery conditions. Temperatures uh, still relatively mild, I guess you'd have to say, even though they are a little bit below normal. And once again across the country, the range of temperatures uh, is still not that extreme. Uh, through the prairies, uh, for example, we're looking at temperatures in the uh, minus three, minus four range with uh, mostly clear skies. A lot of snow in Brandon, Manitoba, yes. Yesterday. They had about 42 centimeters, and uh, the Winnipeg area is expecting a few uh, snow flurries through tonight as well. Southern Ontario, uh, basically clear conditions overnight. Uh, same thing through uh, southern Quebec. And uh, through the Maritimes in Atlanta, Canada, we do have a mix of conditions, some showers uh, in Halifax and basically clear skies in St. John's, Newfoundland. Now, as for us, we do have that situation. As we said, we've got showers continuing through tonight. And we are hoping to see some improvement come tomorrow. Let's show you our forecast then for Greater Vancouver. The lower Fraser Valley, southern Vancouver Island. More showers through tonight with a low down to 2 degrees. Chance of showers tomorrow morning. And we're expecting some afternoon sunny breaks. And it does look better in the long range as well. Monday back to showers. Tuesday and Wednesday, we do have a mix of sun and clouds. Simi, I wanted to mention a big event Wednesday at the Waterfront Center Hotel with 12 of BC's best chefs preparing recipes. It's called Savor British Columbia. The project is presented by the Culinary Arts Foundation and the BCIT American Marketing Association and serves as a warm-up uh, later this year when BCIT's team will be competing against the best chefs in the world in Singapore. That's Wednesday at the Waterfront Center Hotel for BCIT. Okay, Joe. Oh, sounds good. Try to stay dry. I will. Okay, thanks. Right. It was a day of mourning in Florida as funerals were held across the state for victims of last week's deadly tornadoes. Friends and family gathered to remember those who didn't survive. The twisters killed at least 39 people and injured more than 250 others when they touched down in central Florida. 1,400 buildings were damaged and more than 300 homes were destroyed. Insurance companies estimate the losses at more than $140 million. Still ahead on Global News, we'll take you to a place where man's best friend rules the roost. On early sports page, the NHL's desert battle between the Stars and the Coyotes. And a no-smoking campaign that gets kids off to an early start. For those of you who missed it, our top story tonight, Vancouver City Council is moving to regulate street performers. It wants to impose yearly license fees as well as limit where buskers can play, what they can play, and for how long. The Canadian Medical Association is accusing Ottawa of playing politics while patients are dying. A spokesperson for the CMA says the Liberal budget focused on education because it offers a bigger political payoff than health care. 
Governments spend millions of dollars every year to try and stop kids from smoking, and even they admit their efforts aren't working. But in the Maple Ridge area, health officials are taking the matter into their own hands and coming up with some results. I was a model of cigarette heads, and I convinced many young people to smoke. I hope I can convince you not to. I smoke since grade eight, so it's like I've been smoking for like like four years, so I'm like I'm hooked. And the program that they do where they come to the schools and they talk to you and they're trying to get you guys to quit smoking, do you think that'll make a difference with kids? Younger kids. Yeah, but not, not like high ones. school. They just take it as a joke. Yeah. That's not what the government wants to hear. In recent years, they've cracked down on teen smoking. But these girls, who are 17 and 18, say the messages aren't working. They should target the younger kids, like, before they enter high school, because then that way they, they know, like, it's bad and stuff. So that's exactly what's being done. Health and school board officials are banding together in the Ridge Meadows area to fight smoking. They formed the Tobacco Reduction Action Committee, and with help from the community, they're targeting kids in grades 6 and 7 in a comprehensive program. The teens that are older help us in making decisions on the material that we should give to the younger kids. Trying to build self-esteem among girls is a big part of the program because that's a major reason why girls take up smoking, and more and more of them are doing it all the time. 28% of our girls are smoking routinely, and 23% of, of the boys are smoking routinely. And the big concern is that it's increasing in, in the female population. Girls often need to be shown what the effects of smoking will be, and that's what this program aims to show them. What I have found the most useful when I was a secondary school administrator was I would talk to the girls particularly about the effect that smoking has on their skin. And we would talk about some of the older women that they had seen and the wrinkles that they could observe. And I even had a mother phone me one day and say, I don't know what you said to my daughter, but it really made a difference. By showing young kids, especially girls, the risks of taking up the smoking habit, health officials hope to make a difference in the long run. And U.S. companies and sports organizations now have a new drug testing device in their arsenal, the lollipop. After it's been in the mouth just a few seconds, the specially designed lollipop can detect traces of cocaine, marijuana, and other drugs. Kudos to 12 of the province's outstanding high school students at the Premier's Excellence Awards today. The awards are based on academic excellence, community service, and school service. Premier Clark presented each of the 12 with a medal of recognition, but the big prize is the $5,000 scholarship to attend post-secondary institutions in the province. A long battle over the remains of Russia's last Tsar is over. With Friday's announcement, the bones will be buried in the former imperial capital of St. Petersburg. Global's Jennifer Griffin has more on the three-sided dispute between local governments, national officials, and the Russian church. It's turning into an unholy battle between Russia's church and state, centered on a controversial decision about where to bury the bones of Russia's last royal family. The government has decided to overrule church objections and bury Nicholas II in St. Petersburg. We decided the burial will take place on the 17th of July at the Peter and Paul Fortress. The decision was unanimous. Nicholas and his family will be buried exactly 80 years after the Bolsheviks murdered them in the town of Yekaterinburg. The family was killed after the communists took over Russia, hoping to put an end to a decadent regime. The question remains what happened to the Tsar's youngest daughter, Anastasia. The remains of two of the children have not been identified. The Russian Orthodox Church says it can't go along with the decision because it is not convinced by scientific tests that say these are the remains of the Romanovs. The decision of the State Committee on the Tsar's remains caused a serious doubt and sparked a great debate within the Church and society. The Orthodox Church wants to make Nicholas and his family saints. If they do, and the bones are later found to be fake, church officials think the controversy could lead to a schism if followers find out they are worshipping false relics. Analysts say it's nothing more than a power struggle. The church is least of all interested in the actual remains. Their authenticity is just one of the factors in this game. It's a game in which these bones are the prize in the ongoing tug of war.
Most people want to lay the controversy to rest and bury the czar once and for all. But the controversy is turning into a struggle between an increasingly powerful church and a government that wants to close another chapter from its brutal communist past. Jennifer Griffin, Global News, Moscow. The Canucks took their new look team to Calgary last night. Early sports page is up next and we'll show you the highlights along with all the rest of today's sports news. And tough times for the owners of the Canucks. We'll have those details next. This is Global News, where news is now. Huge salary commitments and U.S. funds combined with a weak Canadian dollar have the ownership of the Vancouver Canucks seeing red. Northwest Sports Enterprises, which owns the team, is posting a whopping $50 million loss over a six-month period that ended December 31st. The same time last year, the company lost $9 million. Northwest Sports Enterprises, owned by Orca Bay Sports and Entertainment, which owns the Vancouver Grizzlies and GM Place. And special guest star Barry McDonald is here with Sports Today. But the way they're playing right now, they could get to the playoffs and cut some of those losses. You, you think, think so? Mr. I don't. I don't. In a Seattle I, I think they've already sort of unloaded a few big salaries there and trying to uh, do that. But I'm pinch hitting for shorty today. Are you? New shirt, new so tie. So far, doing a fabulous job. New shirt, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, I think. Good evening, everyone. The uh, Canucks resume their pursuit of a playoff spot tonight, hosting Ottawa. It's a 7:30 start at the Garage. Vancouver uh, starting the night eight points out of the eighth and final spot, but they are playing much better. Six wins and last night's tie in Calgary to show for their last eight games. And we'll have highlights from the Saddle Dome in a moment. But first, let's get to a busy Saturday afternoon in the NHL, shall we? We'll start in Dallas. The Stars hosting Phoenix. Dallas jumping out to a 1-0 lead. Jamie Langenbrunner, the man with a long name, scoring a short goal. The deflection from in very close. It was 1-0 Dallas. Phoenix uh, unable to muster much offense. Uh, and when they did, they either missed the net or they couldn't beat Eddie Belfour. Oh boy, it was a different story at the other end. Stars had a 4-0 lead after two periods. Great setup coming up here by Mike Medallin. Misses the pass, but look what he does here. Great setup to Grant Marshall. Second of the game for Grant, 4-0 the final in Big D. Belfort with a shutout. It's his eighth of the season. Likely his easiest as the slumping Coyotes could only manage 13 shots on him. Phoenix is winless in six. Five of those six are losses. The other would be a tie. The LA Kings with just one loss in their last 13 games. They take a 2-1 second period lead on the Blues this afternoon. Glenn Murray scoring his 20th goal of the season. However, the Blues came back. Boy, did they ever. Two goals in 10 seconds. Here's the second one. Pierre Turgeon gets credit for it. It went on off Rob Blake. St. Louis, four unanswered goals and a 5-2 victory over the Kings. Jeff Cordnell, three points. Steve Deshane opened the scoring in this one with the 200th goal of his career. Blues fourth in the Western Conference. Six points up on the Kings. Grant Fear gone four weeks. And Gary Suter continues to play as Paul Correa wonders what day it is. Doesn't seem right. Hawks in Colorado this afternoon. Chicago opening the scoring early in the second period. Jeff Chance with the deflection. And then they get a shorthanded goal. Zanov to Amonte. It went in off his skate. It, uh, he didn't direct it in. At least that's what the officials ruled. It counted. 2 nothing Hawks. They make it 3-zip early in the third. Krivo Krasov beating Craig Billington. Chicago blanks the avalanche. 4 nothing in Denver. Suter actually back from a four-game suspension, but you get my point. Jeff Hackett pitched the shutout for Chicago, stopping all 33 shots he faced. He now has six shutouts this season. Colorado 0 for 8 with a man advantage. Rangers took a 1-0 lead into the third period this afternoon against Philly, but the lead would not hold up. Klatt, Lindros, Forbes scoring third period goals for the Flyers. Mike Sillinger picked up an assist. John Muckler losing his Madison Square debut. Bruins hosting Pittsburgh. Bruins beating Pittsburgh. Short-handed goal here. Set up by Jason Allison. Scored by Dimitri Kristic. 3-0 Boston after one period. Penguins get one back in the second period. Stu Barnes sending Martin Straka away. He gets hooked. He gets tripped. He gets the red light turned on. 3-1 Pens within two after two, but... Bruins scored three times in the third period. Jason Allison finishing with a goal and four assists. Only nine players in the entire NHL have more points than Jason Allison. Sergei Samsonov, pretty fair rookie for the Bruins. He chipped in with three assists. Tampa Bay with just 11 wins in 58 games, hosting Washington. Paul Eisbart beating Olaf Kolzig from somewhere he shouldn't have. 2-0 Lightning into the second period. Caps cut the lead in half as Callie Johansson bagged his 13th of the season. That was a powerful play goal, and it was 2-1. Uh, Ron Wilson's Caps tied it at two, but the Lightning struck for two goals within 15 seconds late in the second period. Jody Hull with one of them, 5-2 Tampa Bay. The final crazy scheduling results in Washington playing its third straight game against Tampa Bay. 
and the Caps have managed to lose all three. Kolzig and Ranford, both one-time New West Bruins, give up five goals on just 22 shots. Three other games in progress. It was 1-0 Toronto after two. Felix Potvin with 21 saves through the first two periods, but Berezan has scored in the third. It's 2-0 Leafs. Habs have been the have-nots lately with uh, just three wins in their last ten games. Hurricanes and Devils in the uh, third period. 2-1 Joyce, Niedermeyer and Sure for the Devils. Primo for the Canes, who have Trevor Kidd in nets tonight, not Kirk McLean. Oilers are uh, hosting the Sharks. Two teams, Vancouver must pass en route to the postseason. Friesen for the Sharks. It's McKillis, Hammerlick and Waite scoring for Edmonton Sharks. One point up on the Oilers for the eighth and final playoff spot in the West. Yurke Lume. <laughs> Still suffering jet lag after returning from the Olympics. Man, he and the Canucks fell behind 3-1 last night to the Flames. Lots of uh, Canucks around Arthur Zerbe, but none could stop Andrew Castles. 3-1 Calgary, ninth for Castles. Vancouver got even early in the third period. Todd Bertuzzi, the pass. Marcus Naslin, great shot. Just like that, Canucks and Flames were all even, but not for long. Michael Nylander got himself in behind the Vancouver defense here. Then he'll slide one under Sean Burke. Flames back in front. It was 4-3. However, with less than four minutes to play, Vancouver gets even again. Lume starts the play, and after a Bure shot, Lume finishes the play. That's a great cure for jet lag. 4-4 the final last night in Calgary. Vancouver with a couple of fresh faces. That's quite a shot, huh? <laughs> a couple of fresh faces in the lineup tonight. Burt Robertson and Chris McAllister. McAllister taking Adrian Coyne's spot on the back end. And uh, will Mike Keenan start tonight the way he finished last night with Sean Burke between the pipes? Well, we'll tell you tomorrow on Early Sports Page, won't we? <laughs> Semi-final action from the Scott Tournament of Hearts. That is Ontario's Anne Merklinger with the final rock of the eighth end against Sandra Schmerler, representing Team Canada, of course. The hit and stick for three. That finished off Schmerler's remarkable run, which included Olympic gold in Nagano. She uh, shook hands after eight ends. Ontario wins 9-3 and faces Alberta's Kathy Borst for the Canadian title tomorrow. Boy, the BC Lions have a huge hole to fill at wide receiver. They've lost Alfred Jackson to the Baltimore Ravens of the NFL. Jackson had 70 catches last season. Ten of them went for touchdowns. But this season, he'll be on the other side of the ball. If he sticks with the Ravens, the Ravens want him to play as a DB, which he played uh, previously in the NFL with the Minnesota Vikings. El Nino not getting the best of this week's PGA stop. It's the Nissan Open in Los Angeles. Billy Mayfair was the leader after two rounds. And uh, Tiger Woods getting himself into contention today. And so did Skip Kendall. This would be Skip's chip. Uh, Skip lost in a playoff earlier this month to Scott Simpson. At, uh, All right, made short. Anyway, he had the best round of the day, a 7 under 64. He's two strokes off the pace. And so is the man holding that putter. Tiger Woods, 665, a round that included an eagle on a par four hole. That was the birdie putt there. Uh, he was temporarily uh, leading this tournament. Kendall would end up with a course record, but he's two back of the leader, who is Tommy Armour. Mayfair is one back, then it's Kendall, Woods, Scott Hoke, Bob Estes, and Payne Stewart. They are all within two strokes. Pat Riley looking uh, pretty spiffy. He's a staccato guy. He shops here when he comes in town. He's Miami Heat in New Jersey this afternoon. That's Tim Hardaway finding a way to the rack, but the Heat were down a dozen at halftime. Things get a little feisty here. Yeah, they do. Fourth quarter, Keith Van Horn hammered as he goes to the hoop. Mark Askins with the cheap shot. That is a style that Riley embraces, incidentally. Sherman Douglas went after Askins. Van Horn was okay, despite what you see there. Miami outscored the Nets 32-15 in the final quarter. The Heat overcoming a 20-point deficit. They won at 95-93. Miami has won 13 of its last 14 games. Alonzo Mourning leading the way. Yes, with lots of help, of course. 28 points for Alonzo. Grizzlies are back in town. They take on Atlanta. Tomorrow, tip-off high noon at the garage. UBC upset UVic 83-82 in Canada West playoff action last night. It's a best two out of three. Game two tonight in Victoria. The T-Birds hockey team beat Calgary 4-1 last night. That's a bit of an upset, too. Game two of that best of three is going tonight in Calgary. And how about those Leafs in a battle of the original six? The two uh, Canadian teams getting after it tonight, the two oldest, you know what I mean. I know what Long you mean. What you meant, but anyway. you should explain that to everybody else. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah unless I get tongue-tied, of course. How about this? Three nothing Toronto in the third period. That's that an easy way out. Sense. It yeah. is. Thank you very much. You're welcome. See you tomorrow. So nice to see you here. Good to, oh, goody. Good to we'll be see seen. you tomorrow. Too. All right. Sorry. Okay. okay. <laughs> if you're a lefty, you must know someone who is. Surveys show that almost 30% of the population is left-handed, yet many products found in stores are made just for right-hand use. But there is some hope out there. At one shop, Larry Himmel explains. We get requests for this all over the world. 
Back in 1980, Mary Coley found a marketing niche. I'm not left-handed. My brother was left-handed. And the problems that he had, I just thought it would be a neat and unique idea. Nestled in the back of a magic store, Mary opened the Southpaw shop, the only California business catering entirely to lefties, stocking items like left-handed scissors and knives and soup ladles. Can openers, you're able to hold it and turn it with your dominant hand. Do you know why I couldn't get on the high school basketball team? Because I couldn't go to my left. Okay. <laughs> and lefties have even entered the computer age. Left-handed mouse, it also helps for the carpal tunnel. <laughs> well, if you're a magic shop as well, I wonder if you have a left cheek whoopee cushion. No, ours are ambidextrous, <laughs> but we have whoopee cushions. <laughs> And they're actually left-handed notebooks. Yeah. The spiral's on the right-hand side. The pens are all non-smear, and so are the pencils. So when the lefty writes and they bring their hand across, it doesn't smear on them. There are left-handed <laughs> oven mitts. First, we have clocks that are backwards. This is kind of a novelty thing. And the left-handed ruler. Well, see, lefties have always taken the right-handed ones, turned them over. There are left-handed playing cards <laughs> and, and left-handed left reading left. cards. Are they smarter than righties? They're very creative. Open Almost as creative finger. as the woman who found her niche. You're not a lefty. That's true, but I am a businesswoman. Very <laughs> humble for CBS News. A tragic note from Hollywood tonight. Actor J.T. Walsh is dead. He suffered a heart attack yesterday while vacationing near San Diego. Walsh made appearances in nearly 60 films, usually playing a villain. Among his credits, A Few Good Men, Backdraft, and Executive Decision. He also starred in Unsub, a short-lived, locally produced TV show. J.T. Walsh was 54 years old. And coming up next on Global News, it's a hotel fit for a king. Except the ones in charge here are man's best friend. What lengths will people go to, especially when it comes to our furry four-legged friends? Steve Hartman takes us to the loved dog company where dogs and their needs come first. Ken Gold is leaving his Labrador for the weekend, and he's worried his dog is going to absolutely hate being left alone in a kennel. Is that him on the couch? Well, Ken Gold, rest assured, because this is not your typical kennel. No. In fact, Tamar Geller says her kennel is unlike any other. <laughs> because her kennel is cageless. Overnight guests are free to walk where they want, much to the chagrin of the four-pound Yorkie. They play all day. And then each dog is escorted to its own private room. No chain, no nothing that would make them feel like, you but know, But I don't think, would a dog really care about chain? Big time. You big time. sure? I big think it would time. be the owner that would care about the chain. The owners, the owners, yes, but also dogs, because dogs have memory. Tamar says especially if the dog came from the pound, seeing a cage again can be a traumatic experience. She says a kennel should feel like a home. So you have a skylight for them? Yeah. Yeah. And you have... That's about it. Really. Yeah, yeah. We have to do more decoration for the dogs. Yeah, I know. As of right now, her hotel is a little short on amenities. There's an ionizer for the air and a no pest strip, and that's about it. But Tamar says her guests really aren't too picky in that regard. Give them a night of drinks and dancing, followed by a warm bed, and you've got yourself a happy canine customer. Dogs are pre-screened to weed out any bullies, and there's always someone watching just to make sure that everything is hunky-doggy here at the Holiday Hound. Tamar says, so far, things have gone remarkably well. People don't realize that if it's an open place like this, there's no noise. I mean, look now. What's up? Chill out. You know what? The thing of it is, I think everybody has their calling. I do believe that we have purpose in life. And I do believe that my purpose is to improve quality of life for dogs. And she is convinced that this is the first step. It costs to be a part of it, $40 a night. And please, don't tell her your dog ate the check. She's already heard that one. Steve Hartman for CBS News. Now to another canine caper in India. They say you can't teach a dog new tricks, but Pipu, a Spanish Doberman, is proving them wrong. He is an expert coconut husker, and his owners say he can husk 10 to 15 of them a day. But on vet's orders, he's only allowed to get his teeth on one or two each day. It's a good skill to have in India where coconuts are a culinary staple. 
and stay with us. We'll be back right after this. Recapping our top stories tonight, Vancouver City Council wants to regulate busking in the city, including an annual license fee. Asia's economic crisis is driving two major container ship lines, Maersk and Sealand, to pull out of the port of Vancouver. Northwest Sports Enterprises, the public company which owns the Canucks, is $15 million in the red in the final six months of last year. And Californians take advantage of better weather to rebuild and reinforce after weeks of flooding. And we just want to apologize for those of you who are waiting for the lottery numbers. We weren't able to get those. The Lottery Corporation couldn't provide them to us in time. Uh, it's probably best to check your morning paper tomorrow morning to get those. All right, gentlemen, Joe's Great. now in from the rain to tell us more about tomorrow's weather. It's an ugly night, Simi, so my plans are set. I'm listening to the best of Cool and the Gang, which is... <laughs> <laughs> which is courtesy of Barry McDonald, who has lent me this uh, selection. Going to be an ugly night tonight. We are expecting this uh, current system to pass through tomorrow. Believe it or not, we're hoping to see some afternoon sunny periods. But until then, expect a lot more rain. The long-range forecast does look a little bit more encouraging, however. Uh, another few showers forecast for Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. That should give us a ridge of high pressure, a mix of sun and cloud moving in. Temperatures, as you can see, not as balmy as they were about a week ago, balmy. but still not uh, not. Well, bad my at question all. is, though, if you've got Barry's favorite CD, what What's on earth that? is he going to do tonight, Barry? Problem, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, Joe's going to be sitting at home alone listening to Ladies Night over and over and over and over again. This is the part of the show we draw attention to the fact that we don't have sports pages on Saturday night yet. So we'll tell you what we'll have on the early uh, edition of the page tomorrow. Highlights of the Canucks game tonight against the Senators and the Grizzlies game tomorrow afternoon against Atlanta. Joe, Simi, back to you. <laughs> thanks, oh, Barry. Yes, it's That's ladies cool, Barry. night. <laughs> well, thanks very much for joining us. We hope you join us again tomorrow night, and we'll see you then. Good night. Good night. <laughs> Fresh. Business can be high tone. I got all I can do just to mind my own. Hi. 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 Hi.